So they took care of everybody but black folk. They included mm -hmm. the Indians in there. That's how Indians got reparations. Legislation, resources, and financial set-asides on the basis of race is only divisive when we're talking about doing it for black Americans. So I'm not going to sit here and say I'm going to do something that's only going to benefit black people. No. Some will even go as far as to call it unconstitutional. Meanwhile, as you can see on the screen right in front of you, the Senate passes largest investment in native programs in history, more than $31 billion heading to native communities. And this comes from the United States Committee on Indian Affairs. U.S. Senator Brian Schatz, chairman of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, helped secure more than $31.2 billion in dedicated funding for tribal governments and native communities, comprising the largest investment in history for native programs. The new funding will deliver immediate relief for hard-hit Native American families and support tribal nations as they build a bridge toward economic recovery. Native communities need relief. We listen and we took action. With more than $31 billion for tribal governments and native programs, the American Rescue Plan delivers the largest one-time investment to native communities in history, said Senator Schatz, a member of the Senate Appropriations Committee. This historic funding is a down payment on the federal government's trust responsibility to native communities and will empower American Indians, Alaska Natives, and Native Hawaiians to tackle C-19's impact on their communities. The $31.2 billion investment in native communities include $20 billion for tribal governments to combat C-19 and stabilize tribal community safety net programs through Treasury, state, and local C-19 relief fund, six plus billion dollars for native health systems, 1.248 billion for HUD tribal and native Hawaiian housing programs, 1.1 plus billion for native education programs, including Bureau of Indian Education tools, tribal education agencies, tribal colleges and universities, native Hawaiian education programs and Alaska native education programs, one plus billion dollars for native families, 900 million dollars for Bureau of Indian Affairs programs, 600 million dollars for native communities critical economic and infrastructure investment 600 million dollars for native communities critical economic and infrastructure investments 20 million dollars to mitigate the impact of c19 on native languages and 19 million dollars for native communities efforts to combat domestic violence now, you know what's really interesting about this is how quietly this all happened. No grandiose congressional hearings, no national polling to see how the American people feel about this, and no mainstream media coverage. The American government just quietly slipped $31 billion to the Native American community. And you know what's even more interesting is that they didn't even have to ask for it. No worldwide global protest, no cities burning down to the ground, but just like that, here goes $31 billion for your problems. Brothers and sisters, really let this sit on your mind for a moment. There are currently 10,000 black elected officials in office in the United States of America. There are 6,000 Hispanic elected officials currently in office. There are even fewer Asian elected officials in office. And I can't even begin to imagine how small the number of Native American elected officials are. It is more than safe to say that there are more black elected officials in the United States than there are Hispanic, Asian, and Native American elected officials combined. Yet the group with the least amount of political representation just got $31 billion slid over to them quietly. Meanwhile, if you're lucky, you might get some monopoly money with Harriet Tubman's face on it by the end of Biden's presidency. And that is, see, they don't do that because right now they want to make sure that Indians in an elevated status over black folk. That came about after about starting about, about 1915 in this country after Indians had a sufficient ass whipping and they had taken and, and the whites had taken over most of the land out west. Right now, black folks should be able to get land from the federal government, just like Indians did, and be able to build their own damn gambling casinos and their own damn communities.
the reparations organizations such as the Foundational Black Americans and the American Descendants of Slaves, this including Claude Anderson's Native Black American Movement. They all need to understand that most Native American tribes and people are not wealthy. Because the cost of repairing and building infrastructure, healthcare, businesses, programs, education, and so on will cost around $1 trillion. And even if you add the over $10 billion in annual federal treaty funding, that isn't even close to addressing the ills and needs of all Native American tribes, who also still face suppressive colonial policies too. Right. It will take decades at this rate for most Native Americans to overcome colonial policy cost disparities and build a strong economy that can address all the socioeconomic and societal challenges in Native communities. If all the reparationist movements want to tackle the socioeconomic issues found in the Black American community, then they should take their demands to Congress, the banks, the states, and corporate headquarters. These entities are the faction of the American population who actually benefited from black enslavement, exploitation, and oppression. The corporate banks, corporate CEOs, and boards sit on tens of trillions of revenue and assets, so why not go after them by issuing thousands of lawsuits? Why do you all want to punish Native communities just because they had leaders of the past and present who fought for their own communities and made treaties? Why don't you all use the 40 acres and a mule promise? the Freedmen Bank and other promises against the feds and sue them? Why not take to the streets and protests for your justice? Why not unite all reparationist organizations and black civil rights movements for a common goal? That fights for civil rights legislation and settlements that is directed at the feds, states, and corporations? Native Americans are divided up by hundreds of tribes and organizations. We sometimes disagree with each other. Yet we natives, for the most part, are united for common goals such as land back, tribal sovereignty and issuing lawsuits. Native American tribal leaders, activists, revolutionaries, and average Native people have used protests, civil disobedience, thousands of lawsuits, road blockades, and even armed resistance to bring attention to the plight of Native people. And they've had some success at receiving justice, but it's not enough, as the natives continue to fight for their rights. Black Americans have won some settlements too, such as the $1.2 billion Black Farmers Settlement, as well as hundreds of lawsuits by black business owners that is aimed at corporations. Some cities are working to make amends to their black population. Of course it's not enough, you just need to keep pressure on the feds, states, and corporations. Attacking and smearing other minority groups and immigrants isn't helping your cause, it's actually chasing away people who otherwise support black reparations movements. There are Latinos, Natives, Asians, and even whites who do support your cause. Maybe you could build more allied coalitions that fight for your black causes and for other causes too. This allied strategy has worked for Native Americans. Where NCAI launched its 75th anniversary the year as, as a difference-making organization protecting tribal sovereignty and advancing tribal priorities. I stand here today to proudly proclaim to you, Congress, the administration, and the world, the state of Indian nations is strong, and we grow stronger. <laughs> we, go, we grow stronger every day. From our cultures and languages to our economies and political power, tribal nations are crafting a great resurgence that is forging brighter futures for our communities and generations yet to come. Despite facing strong headwinds and resistance, we are elevating our presence and voice in this country's public and policy discourse at a time when it's most needed. We're claiming our rightful place as the original pieces in the mosaic of America, and our rightful role as con key contributors in the charting of its future course. The signs of our resurgence are everywhere. They're seen in sports and the arts, where increasingly we're sharing our stories and identities with mainstream society. From actor Wes Studi speaking his Cherokee language to the world at last year's Oscars, to Onondaga lacrosse star Lyle Thompson 
turning an ugly display of racism into a teachable moment about dignity, empathy, and cultural pride. They're seen in expressions of respect for Native people by those who mold America's youth. From the state of Florida, honoring Joy Prescott, a Seminole immersion school teacher as Teacher of the Year, to Little League International's decision to ban, to ban race-based mascots from all sanctioned competition. Our resilience is seen in tribal nations building of robust economies, which provide jobs and families, economic security to hundreds of thousands of Native people and tens of thousands of non-Native people. Indian country has a long way to go, but in more and more places, we are becoming the primary drivers of economic growth, fostering a better quality of life for all. Our unity is seen in our growing alliances, powerfully, powerfully displayed in recent legal briefs defending the Indian Child Welfare Act. They saw 325 tribal nations, 57 native organizations, 31 child welfare organizations, 21 states, several members of Congress, and other partners join forces to keep Native children immersed in their tribal families, cultures, languages, and communities. Our strength is heard. <laughs> our strength is heard in the enduring power of our songs, prayers of tolerance, and humility, sung in a, with a good mind and enlightening purpose in the face of ignorance and arrogance. It is seen in the midterm elections in North Dakota, New Mexico, Minnesota, and elsewhere. Native people, understanding the stakes, turned out to the polls like never before, despite term determined efforts to keep us away. In many places, we were the margin of victory, showing we are a political force to be reckoned with. And our resurgence is seen in the record number of Native candidates who ran for federal, state, and local offices, and won. Black Americans have won some settlements, too. We end today's show with the historic $2 billion payout by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to black farmers and other farmers of color who experienced discrimination when applying to the USDA's farm loan programs. We're joined by John Boyd, a fourth-generation black farmer and founder and president of the nonprofit National Black Farmers Association, which fought for these payouts that have now gone out. John, welcome back to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Explain the significance um, of what's happening right now. Amy, thank you so much for having me, and it's always good to, to uh, spend time with you. This is a very, very uh, historic uh, payout for black farmers, and, and I see it as a huge win for myself and the, the National Black Farmers Association that worked on this for nearly four decades. Uh, so basically, uh, 60,000 uh, applications uh, were turned in, 45,000 uh, black farmers and other farmers of color uh, have begun uh, receiving checks uh, this week and the latter part of, of last week. Uh, so it's very, very good news and a total of uh, $2 billion. Uh, so we've been waiting for this payout for a long time. And uh, we, the MBFA went out and held 60 meetings, uh, Amy, and, and FaceTime uh, with uh, our members. We sent out 130,000 uh, postcards in the mail to all of our members, uh, telling them how to apply for this. It took us, Amy, on average three to three and a half hours to help each and every uh, uh, black farmer fill out this 40-page application, so it was a very extensive uh, uh, process, and uh, so we were glad to get the news that uh, from Stephen Benjamin at the White House actually called me and told me uh, that the checks were actually going out to to farmers around the country. So we see this as a huge significance of farmers who are facing foreclosure. We have a lot of black farmers in our in our organization that were facing foreclosure. So these payments are timely. Uh, it's going to help them stay on the farm or help them improve the equipment, help them pay taxes. Uh, and I'm not saying it's a whole holistic fix, but it's certainly uh, a huge thumb up for us. And Amy, we're still pushing for the $5 billion in debt relief. So I'm asking the administration uh, to do that by executive order. 
That's what I've been uh, having conversations with the White House uh, to uh, still get the five billion. That's the land that's owned by many black farmers that have their deeds of trust uh, tied up with the United States Department of Agriculture. And again, that's a decade old uh, request as well. In 1963, Martin Luther King delivered his iconic I Have a Dream speech to hundreds of thousands of people who marched on Washington demanding equal rights for black Americans. Over the next two years, lawmakers passed sweeping civil and voting rights legislation, but many feel there was no reckoning for America's two and a half centuries of slavery and its legacy of racial inequality. Jumao Juwanza's ancestors were enslaved in Alabama and Tennessee. There have been calls for reparations. It may have been called a different term, but the social justice call, the uh, stopping the discrimination call, stopping the racism call, stopping the inequities in terms of uh, access to the rights and privileges of being uh, in America call has been ongoing. Since slavery was officially abolished in 1865, Campaigners have suggested options, including cash payments, funding for schools, or college scholarships. But Congress is yet to approve a single suggestion. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. Recent Black Lives Matter protests have reignited the issue. The problem wasn't a, a created short-term, easy problem. It's not going to be a short-term, easy solution. And unless we deal with the fundamental underlying basis for relationships in this country, then we're gonna end up in the same place. I don't know, so let's talk about a company who's trying to work much closer with uh, Soulmates. Uh, they're investing in black women-owned businesses through one of its uh, one million black women initiatives with $2.1 billion already being invested in businesses and nonprofits. So the initiative aims to positively impact one million black women by 2030, and Goldman Sachs has committed to $10 billion in investment capital and $100 million in uh, philanthropic uh, capital. The advisory council includes Valerie Jarrett, Condoleezza Rice, and Issa Rae, and will provide 23 million dollars in philanthropic uh, capital to assist close to 250,000 black women. Research shows the best way to close the racial wealth gap is by investing in black women. Target's announcement Wednesday to invest $2 billion over the next five years with black-owned businesses, increase the number of products carried from black-owned businesses to at least 500, offer more partnerships with black-owned marketing and construction companies, and offer support and growth potential for new black entrepreneurs. Having a partner that's willing to you know, help see where you're going, but also work with you where you are. In a press release, Target's chief growth officer, Christina Hennington, said, quote, we have a rich history of working with diverse businesses, but there's more we can do to spark change across the retail industry, support the black community, and ensure black guests feel welcomed and represented when they shop at Target. In Minnetonka, Chris Harapsky, CARE 11 News. Target says today's announcement builds on other commitments the company has made, like increasing black Target employees by 20% over the next three years. Yeah, you know, what, such a great, this is such a great tee up for something that we are just so delighted to actually be announcing today, which captures so much of what we're talking about here. And it's our equitable path forward. The real estate industry, if you look at it today, when you look at who builds these communities, they're white led. When you look at who, um, who, who creates these communities, and it's like of the real estate industry, 2% are black led. So what Enterprise is launching today, actually, coincidentally, is Equal Path Forward, where we will invest in black led, uh, other uh, minority led organizations to build the communities. This is where people live. We need to provide them the access to capital that we've been hearing about today. They don't have the friends and family money which is needed in real estate. So we are launching a $3.5 billion initiative. Corporate America is helping us. In fact, our first investor is Netflix, where we are going to provide the capital, the training that John is talking about, to, to, to build these communities. I think as we think about how these communities are, it's also engaging the communities. It's that community engagement. What do they need and have them built by those who know what's needed, uh, know what's required, and let's support them by bringing them capital, supports, uh, the knowledge, but also the pipeline. And I think that that, that 
part of it is critically important as well. And we're just so delighted to be able to do that with our partners. You, you well, that's news. Th that is news. And, <laughs> and thank you for that. We're talking kind of billions here. Um, can you, yeah. so just quickly, why is Netflix, why is the private sector kind of tuning into this problem now? Yeah, you know, I, I, that's a great question. And I, I, I am optimist in a time when it's hard to be optimist. I think corporate America is realizing that these are communities where their workers are, where their customers are, and this is a, a reckoning in our country, and everyone has to be at the table. Government cannot do it alone. Uh, the private sector can't do it alone. Philanthropy can't do it alone. We all have to work together to build a more inclusive, equitable society. And, and I, I believe these efforts, if you look at what the Business Roundtable has come out with, these are some bold efforts by corporate America. They need to be part of the solution to build these communities. It lifts the entire economy when communities are stronger, uh, what it does for GDP, what it does for the labor, mar the labor markets, and they have to put their money on the table. And that's what Netflix is doing with us today. J.P. Morgan Chase plans to extend billions in loans to black and Latino home buyers and small business owners. The company says it's part of an expanded effort toward fixing systemic racism in America's economic system. The bank has pledged a total of $30 billion over the next five years to help black and Latino families buy homes. The money will also provide financing to build affordable rental housing units. The company initially committed $1.75 billion toward programs to help address racial inequality and economic mobility in the wake of George Floyd's death. Citigroup also announced last month it's committing $1 billion toward closing the racial wealth gap in the U.S. Bank of America was ordered Monday to pay 1,147 African-American job applicants $2,181,593 in back wages and interest after a judge found that the company's Charlotte office had racially discriminated against them. In addition, Bank of America has been ordered to offer jobs to 10 applicants who were originally turned down. Judge Linda S. Chapman ruled that the bank used unfair and inconsistent selection criteria when it routinely chose white applicants over black job seekers in 1993 and again between 2002 and 2005. Bank of America rigorously contested the allegations and argued that the Labor Department did not have the legal authority to impose fines against it, but the judge sided with the government's claim that because the bank is a federally insured entity, it qualifies as a federal contractor. The ruling was a long-awaited victory for the Labor Department, which had first brought the case to court in 1997. The bank, meanwhile, refused to comment on the specifics of the ruling. Bank of America is pledging to address racial and economic inequalities by partnering with community colleges and universities, as well as some major employers. Today, the company announced its $25 million commitment to assist in what it calls upskilling and reskilling for black and Hispanic Latino students. The move comes as studies continue to show the country's education system disproportionately fails students of color. As calls for reparations continue to grow across the U.S., Catholic priests have vowed to raise $100 million to benefit descendants of enslaved people. Leaders in the Catholic Church acknowledge that the institution was built on the backs of slaves, and they say this is a move towards racial healing. Joining us live now to talk more about it is Ambassador Susan Johnson Cook. She is the former U.S. Ambassador for Religious Freedom and served three terms as U.S. Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom under the Obama administration. Ambassador Cook, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to BNC. Thank you so much for having me, it's my honor. Well, this $100 million fund for reparations is the largest such effort by the Roman Catholic Church. What are your thoughts on it? Well, I am so excited. Certainly, I'm from the village of Harlem. This is my 40th year in ministry. Certainly, I'm not a priest, but we're very close to the village of Harlem with those who are, and I have family members who are Catholic. So we are very excited that the Jesuit order actually has made this begun, this happen. And so we are excited that finally uh, some reparations can happen, and hopefully this will lead the way for other uh, denominations, other sectors of America to begin to do the same. Affirmative action began as riot control. Harlem was up in flames. Bed-Stuy was up in flames. Newark was up in flames. 
And if we don't do something to bring in young black people to the mainstream economically and educationally, we're not sure the society will hold together. The words affirmative action initially were attempts to deal with discrimination that African Americans face in the labor market. There were executive orders by President Kennedy and President Johnson which said employers had to make a good faith effort to use affirmative action in their hiring and recruitment policies, which meant they were going to try to recruit people who had once been discriminated against. I have some very sad news for all of you, and that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. After the assassination of Dr. King, there were riots in 60 American cities simultaneously. The leaders of the society, whether they were in government, business, or academia, said this society can't hold together if black people are burning the cities. And they're burning the cities because they feel excluded. So we've got to bring them into our workplace. We've got to bring them into our educational institutions. We've got to let them feel that they have a stake in the, the society. It was a very effective response to urban unrest. Hundreds of thousands of people being hired by major corporations who wouldn't have been hired. You had colleges admitting large numbers of black students who previously only admitted a handful. It really changed the country. Something I'm really proud of, because I've been saying it, what do you have to lose? African-American unemployment is at its lowest level ever recorded. That was President Trump Thursday, continuing, as I suggested before the break, to ride the coattails of his predecessor, President Barack Obama, in claiming that his policies are to be thanked for the record low unemployment numbers among black Americans, a fallacy easily dissolved when you look at when the trend started. And as you can see, it was in January of last year. Joining me now is former acting secretary of labor under President Obama, Seth Harris. Thank you, uh, former Secretary Harris. Uh, let, let, let's go right to it. President Trump is trying to tell people that he is responsible for record low African American unemployment. Is that any way, shape, or, or form even possibly true? It's not, Rev. Um, there, we've had 87 consecutive months of job growth in the United States dating back to 2010. You may remember that you and I used to talk about the jobs numbers back when I was the uh, President Obama's yeah, Secretary of Labor. Yeah, you used to come Labor. on my uh, radio show every month and report then Perez would after you. I remember. Absolutely right. And so we've had long-term recovery from the Great Recession that President Obama led, but he was helped by Democrats in Congress who passed the largest stimulus bill in American history. Um, and it's important to remember that even though President Trump is talking about how low African-American unemployment is now, and that's true, it's still almost double the unemployment of white Americans. We still have structural problems in our economy that are causing African Americans to still have face a disadvantage in the labor market, and we still have a lot of work to do. And let me say, I see no evidence at all that President Trump is doing the hard work that's required to fix that problem. Now, we saw the decline. First of all, President Obama came in, the whole economy was on very shaky ground. He recovered the economy, brought unemployment down, and brought African-American unemployment way down. It is time now for our Equity and Opportunity Series, and Frank Holland joins us this morning with a closer look at the growth in black spending power. Frank. Hey, good morning to you, Andrew. Black spending power reached a record $1.6 trillion in 2021. The ability to buy, save, and invest more than doubling since 2000. That growth exceeding the full U.S. economy, but actually lagging other ethnic groups, Latinos with a 288% increase, Asians with a 388% increase in spending power. However, 
Other groups, they've also seen an increase in their net worth. Black Americans instead have seen their wealth actually fall by 14 percent. And with the S&P gaining 27 percent last year, the value of U.S. homes increasing by 31 percent last year, many black leaders are asking the black community to really rethink how it spends. Save money to purchase the most important asset you'll probably ever own, and that's your home. And that, to me, is, is equally important, as I said. I, I put it right up there with uh, arguing or campaigning for or supporting voting rights. I would love to see us spend more money in the stock market instead of uh, buying the hottest new thing, buy the stock of the hottest new thing. And that's something that is something that you can also pass down generation to generation. Home ownership is typically the biggest wealth builder in the black community. That's actually fallen more than 3% since 2000. And annually, black families accumulate $300 billion less in wealth than white families, and they save $75 billion less. The racial wealth gap now at more than $11 trillion. Back over to you. Frankie, the, the statistics are startling and fascinating in so many different ways. Do business leaders and other experts have thoughts on how to stop the trend and what's really behind it? Yeah, of course. I mean, some of it is simply allocating more capital to assets that at least have the potential to appreciate things like houses, stocks and bonds. Other reasons are systemic. And that's why about one out of every five black family has a negative net worth right now. Systemic issues, uh, redlining and housing, uh, disparities in education and other issues that are going to take a longer time to address.